I, I know it maybe sounds weird, but the idea of like a sociopath where it becomes all about mimicking the behaviors where you have to put all of this thought into like, okay, I put my arm here. This indicates this behavior, like all of those components into being able to, to start trying to develop friendships. Yeah. Welcome. Hello. Um, so can you first tell me what you, you know, what you go by and, and how you'd like to be addressed today? Um, Des is fine. Des? Okay. I'm all ochre, Dr. K. It's nice to meet you, Des. Nice to meet you as well. Um, thank you very much for, you know, coming on. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, is there something in, so can you just tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, I understand you're a streamer. So can you tell us a little bit about what kind of, what kind of streaming you do and where we can find you? Uh, so yes, I, I focus a lot on charity. Um, it's, it's one of the things that I've really have found to just help with my own mental health. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, one of the things that they recommend is helping others tends to be like the, the best way to kind of just deal with your own problems and kind of, you know, get a lot of that, um, intrinsic value. Okay. So I've been doing that a lot. Um, you can find me at twitch.tv Dust Mephisto. I mainly play a lot of World of Warcraft, uh, things like speed running, um, collecting. I really, really enjoy collecting things. That that sense of completion is really satisfying. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks a lot. And um, is there something in particular that you wanted to talk about today, Des? Um, so really, I just want to go in and get across what autism is i want to kind of engage with the the community and help create some understanding of um that that concept especially like when i didn't get diagnosed until i was 29 and what i thought autism was growing up as a kid isn't what it turned out to be mm -hmm. and then there there's the whole issue of things like aba and there's there's this big charity event going on right now that is uh, Color the Spectrum, which I think is sending out a lot of mixed messages about what autism is and is more so hurtful to autistics rather than helpful. Interesting. So um, a, a lot of uh, so okay. So that that sounds uh, like a great structure. Des, do you mind if I ask you? Um, just throughout this conversation, I think a lot of times the way that we try to illustrate things is by asking people sort of like personal questions about their experience of a particular thing, whether it be like, you know, dealing with, um, you know, toxicity in gaming or, you know, dealing with depression, things like that. Is it okay if I ask you, um, you know, personal questions about what your experience of autism is, things like that? Yes, that's completely fine. In fact, I um, recently there was a video that just went viral of a BPD per individual who um, was hitting themselves in the head repeatedly after being um, harassed by a customer. And that video gave me the strength to actually post a video of me having an autistic meltdown on stream. Um, so I'm, I'm very, very open to, to answer anything personal or to do that because I see this as a way of helping others. Sure. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and just, you know, for clarification, if I ever ask you anything that, um, you don't feel is appropriate or you don't feel comfortable answering, you know, please just signal that to me in some way. If I detect from you that maybe we're talking about things that could be making you uncomfortable, I may point it out to you. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, like we're really here to help people, but I don't want you to hurt yourself or sacrifice anything for the sake of the greater good. Okay. If I do so, it's, it's of my own volition. Okay. I, I understand to, to make a difference. Pain is kind of necessary at times, but it's important to recognize that I choose that, not that it's, it's something I'm unwilling of. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty profound statement that pain is necessary sometimes to make a difference. Can you help me understand that? Um being like like being open about autism, like using my life as a kind of open book to help others. One of the things that I've enjoyed most about streaming is having um individuals who didn't realize they themselves were autistic. 
And after seeing and hearing my story and everything that I talked about, make that connection, they go and see a therapist, they go through the practice, and then they get diagnosed themselves, right? It, it puts you in these positions where, you know, I really wish I didn't have to open up about this, but it really also at the same time helps a lot of people. What makes you not want to open up about it? Um, it's, 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 there's a lot of negativity that can come from these things. I mean, for example, the, the sharing the, the video of myself having an autistic meltdown where I, I repeatedly punched myself in the head. It, it, it's, it's scary, right? It's, it's a scary thing to witness. It's something that could potentially make future job opportunities impossible. And I understand though that these things have value and that they can help others. Hmm. And like, it, it, it's that hard thing where I know I can handle it. I know that if things go bad, I can at least, I, I'm sure I can find a way to recover from it. Can Whereas, you, oh, go ahead. No, sorry. sorry. Um, I was just going to say, so you've mentioned autistic breakdown or meltdown a couple of times now, and, and apparently you were, um, you know, hitting yourself. Can you help us understand what you mean by that term? So an autistic meltdown is, I, I would say in some ways, it's similar to like the, the common understanding of a meltdown in a neurotypical individual where everything is at its absolute worst um, in that you, you can't really process anything going on, um, at least to my understanding and um, for myself. Basically, it's like everything ceases to function. The brain goes straight into the fight or flight system, but it doesn't have a way to, to channel it. So everything just kind of blows up. And as a result, I, I, I can't think, I can't function. One of the, the negative stems that I have tends, tends to just be punching myself in the head because I'm so overwhelmed um, it's taken a lot of practice and a lot of awareness to, to be able to, to recognize the only way that I can stop these things is to be aware that I've reached the point of that I'm going to be overwhelmed sooner rather than when it already happened. So it requires a great deal of self-awareness to, to avoid these situations. And can you uh, share at all, like what your experience of being in, in a meltdown is like? It's, it's, it's like, it's, it's almost like, I guess, a panic attack or well, maybe not a panic attack, but it's, it's a blur, right? Mm. So like, I, I don't really have any cognitive processing over what's going on. I don't really understand what's happening. Um, it, it just, it, it is. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's it's really hard to like know what's going on in those moments. Um, I try to basically it's it's I don't want to say it's quite like drowning, but I do feel like there's these little moments where I can get that little breath of air to try and move myself away from it. So and of course, oh, sorry. No, go for it. Um, and of course, like like the the better I get at it, the more I can kind of shut those feelings down, which would result in a shutdown which is kind of like, it, it's, it's like a momentary depression. Well, I wouldn't call it momentary, but it's, it's like this, this depression or this, this weighted blanket, this sinking feeling where everything just becomes super muted. Um, usually if, if I enter that, I'm, I'm out for like two, three, four hours, I'll just end up passing out. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's interesting because what I'm hearing from you is that you know, it takes a lot of awareness to manage, you know, preventing a meltdown, but that when you're actually in the meltdown, you sort of lose yourself. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes on, on stream, we'll kind of joke a little bit about becoming an anger elemental where like your, your personhood becomes like dominated by a particular emotion. And then like some people will be like anger personified or shame personified. And you sort of become like a shame elemental. 
And what I'm sort of hearing from you, just like I'm trying to put myself kind of in your shoes, it's that like you are no longer there and you're just dominated or overwhelmed. You don't have particular cognitions or thought processes. It sounds like there's a lot of emotion that you're experiencing that's quite negative and you're not really in control of your behaviors necessarily either. And that you kind of like, will. it almost reminds me a little bit of, of what I think about kind of physiologically is like, like a seizure actually. So you get this state of hyper ex ex excitation of electrical signal followed by this refractory period where everything kind of shuts down. And, and, yeah. and it, and it's really, yeah, you wanted to say something? Sorry. Oh no, no. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's very, yes. Um, and so can you tell us Des a little bit about, like you said, you were diagnosed at the age of 29 and, and you know, what growing up was like, what you understood autism to be, um, did you recognize in some way that you may not have been neurotypical or how did you understand that? Sure. Um, so in retrospect, like looking back years later, especially after my diagnosis, my my uncle um, is, is mentally challenged and also likely undiagnosed with autism. Um, I had kind of put myself through through um my own version of aba as a kid growing up because i saw the way he was treated um my he was yelled at he was kind of shamed he was dismissed he would have love withheld from him based on his behaviors so every time i saw him walking back and forth i did everything i could to um to uh, uh avoid displaying those behaviors if you know, the, the sound of a spoon on a uh, ceramic bowl was painful to my ears. I would just grin and bear it because I didn't want to display his behavioral characteristics and be treated the, the same way. Um, so, and oh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I keep interrupting you. Um, uh, it's OK. So I'm just so curious, what were the behaviors that you noticed in your uncle? that you didn't um, want to duplicate. So so the the rocking back and forth, the specific um uh reaction to sounds, the way that he interpreted or interacted with problems, um and of course that that even then extended into um excitement. So like things like Christmas, I began to immediately mute that behavior as well. So instead of being excited about Christmas, I was like, "Oh, it's just Christmas." And I did this at a very young age. Because I, I didn't want any of those associated behaviors, which mm. is, I, I think, what resulted in just a lot of knowing and unknowing masking growing up as a kid. I was originally diagnosed with ADHD in third grade. And then um, I, I always knew something was wrong. I just didn't understand what was wrong. Um, the, the best way I could describe it is I always kind of felt like Everyone knew something I didn't know. Hmm. Like I, I, I don't know how to to like like fully explain that, but I always felt like I always just knew something was wrong. And it yeah. wasn't until like I, I graduated um, college that I started to experience um, what is known as autistic burnout, where I lost a lot of my masking and abilities to kind of do things. Things like driving became harder. Um, my um, I that's when I ended up getting diagnosed with OCD Puro because I was having a lot of intrusive thoughts, very obsessive. Um, my anxiety started shooting through the roof. Um, basically all the, the kind of coping mechanisms that I learned how to deal with throughout life, they, they all came crashing down, which ended up leading to the autism diagnosis. And, and you mentioned that, um, you know, you started like muting or masking particular behaviors. It, it sounds like that's a pretty like subconscious process. Is that fair to say? Uh, it was both conscious and subconscious. Um, I mean, I, I would probably uh, equate it to, to um, like instead of being the person to, to touch a hot stove, to be like, oh, that's hot. I used others to learn that. So if I saw someone else treated a certain way, I was like, okay, I'm not going to be act that way because I don't want to be treated that way. 
Um, honestly, I'd say that was kind of like a lot of how I learned things was I had to study other people to understand those behaviors. Yeah. Um, so let me, do you mind explaining what ABA is? Because some people aren't familiar with that. Um, so ABA is a, um, psychological practice. It's a therapy where behaviors that are considered, um, undesirable, are replaced with behaviors that are considered desirable. It, it, I wouldn't say basically like dog training, but very similar. Um, that that idea of like, say, if you wanted to get a person to to make eye contact, you you that used to be that you would punish them if they didn't make eye contact. Now that they they prefer kind of just uh, reward reinforcement. Although at the same time, there's a lot of question. Well, not a lot of question. It's it's mostly an unethical practice. What? Um, okay, so let's let's take sort of like I'm going to table some of the stuff about ABA, color of the spectrum, things like that. I think um, Des, it's very helpful. I, I personally am learning a lot talking to you, and I'd love to just hear more of your raw experience. Uh, because I, I think, you know, rather than using like terms and stuff, which we can definitely get to, I think that the challenge is, like you said, a lot of people with autism feel like, you know, everyone else is watching a movie with the volume on. And like, you can tell, like, you're still watching the movie, so you kind of know what's going on, like you can kind of enjoy what's going on. But it seems like there's something that other people are sort of getting that you don't seem to have access to. I think that's that is such a good and in some ways it's also devastating to kind of hear people talk like that. But when I when I work with people with autism, like I think that's such a beautiful way to describe their experience. It's sort of like, you know, some people just seem to know things that I don't know. I don't know exactly what I'm missing because you can try to be like calculating about it, right? Like you can kind of say like, okay, well, it's clearly not like, you know, I can hear things and they can hear things. It's just things seem to affect me differently or other pe uh, things seem easier for other people. And I don't know why this has to be so hard for me. Um, those are kinds of the sentiments that I've kind of come away with. What do you think? Yes, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, like just everything growing up, like making friends, interacting in school, the interaction with teachers, like all these individual components, every single aspect felt like a struggle because I couldn't, I couldn't connect. I, I struggled to start making friends until I was 21, 22. And the way I went about it was I sat down with a therapist and I told him my plan that I was going to go to bars. I was going to sit there and I was just going to observe, like I wouldn't have a phone or anything. I would just sit there and watch everyone to the point that I would become so bored that the the act of talking with someone would kind of at least compensate for the fear of interaction to some degree as well. But also in that time, I'd be watching, you know, how the body language displayed, what topics were they discussing? You know, how how do they interact? You know, like all these little components, I observed all of that to try and replicate. Um, like, I, I know it maybe sounds weird, but the idea of like a sociopath where it becomes all about mimicking the behaviors where you have to put all of this thought into like, okay, I put my arm here. This indicates this behavior, like all of those components into being able to, to start trying to develop friendships. Yeah. It sounds quite labor intensive. And um, is it okay if I ask you one or two more questions about your uncle? Yes, I, I don't want to go too too personal on my uncle since he's not me. And sure, totally understand. Yeah. So, so this, um, uh, I'll, so I'll, you know, let me know. I'm I'm asking for permission for a reason. So let me know if we skirt that boundary. But what I'd like to understand is like, you know, are there particular experiences that? So, so it sounds to me like you noticed that your uncle behaved in certain ways that maybe you shared certain tendencies with him and then you started to mask or mute those behaviors. Did I understand that correctly? Yes. And I was wondering if you could just illustrate for us like an experience that you had where you saw something and then you recognized like, oh, I shouldn't actually act like that. Um, the one that oddly, like the one that stands out in my mind the most, which is silly, um, was literally how he held a fork. 
Um, my my grandma yelled at him something fierce, like like just just chewed him out at like we were having dinner, and just the way that he held a fork, um, because like he he would hold the fork like with his fist rather than like that, mm-hmm. and that that just it's forever burned in my memory. Um, I remember things like him complaining about the noise of sound and everyone just doubling down on that sound, so that like they they all started doing it like like those little components in seeing how how they were how he was kind of treated was like i i don't remember everything since sure. it was this this is yeah. like i but those those are like two of the things that are really just burned into my memory yeah i i think Des, that was exactly sort of what i was looking for when i asked the question because i think a lot of times I'm trying to imagine that I'm like a 15 year old autistic kid right now or a kid with autism, depending on, you know, what, what's the appropriate way to describe it. Um, and I think the challenge is that like, you know, when we use technical terms, like it doesn't actually capture people's experience. And, and I think the way that you're kind of describing that, like there are these particular things which seem like a little bit, you know, unique or idiosyncratic, but then a lot of people like really, you know, punish people for being a little bit different um, or they don't. It, it's just so foreign to understand that, like, um, or have you ever heard of misophonia? No. So it's interesting. So there's some correlation potentially between I, I don't know if there's some correlation, but misophonia is actually like a, a, a neurological illness or disorder where benign sounds cause people like excruciating pain. And what I'm hearing from you is that, that there are particular sounds which feel very like almost painful to you. And it yes. reminds me of actually misophonia, but um, yeah. So thank you for sharing that. Cause I think that really illustrates it. And, and what did you notice about yourself that was different? One of the major things, well, it, it, it's one of those things like looking back on it now that you notice that it was different. But like, for example, always wearing a beanie. I've always been wearing shorts. Um, I think I got diagnosed with sensory processing, processing disorder fairly early on. Um, I, I vaguely remember going to therapy for it. Uh, but it's it's more of these things where you look back and you start to realize when when you're growing up as a kid, you don't necessarily necessarily think, you know, oh, this is wrong. It's why is this so hard? Why why is it so easy for everyone else? Why can't I accomplish what they're accomplishing? It, it's hard to realize. Like I I didn't grow up in the the best of households, and for me, while growing up through that, I thought that was normal. It wasn't until you know, even when like visiting other places where it was much nicer and everything, I like that was the abnormality to me. It wasn't until I grew up and, you know, met my wife and I started to realize like, oh, that's this. This isn't normal. And so it's it's kind of that that uh, you don't really notice it when you're in there. Um, I kind of forgot the question, though. That's totally cool. I, 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 I loved your answer. Um, so let me just ask a, a different one. What what uh, what was growing up like for you? It was hard. Um, it was it was hard. Uh, friendships were really difficult. The friendships that I did make often resulted in harm to myself. So um, people who I hung out with would end up abusing me um like i i would i'd been hit in the head with a shovel a razor scooter punched in the head repeatedly um i i even i haven't had one instance and this 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 is in a pc gamer article so it's it's um but i was even pissed on at one point um and these were people that i considered friends because you know they they interacted with me hmm. and that was that was rough um i actually caught a bit of asmongold's interview and i could even relate to some of what he was talking about where, where he specifically referenced it as laziness i.e if a light bulb goes off in a room 
he he uh was oh i just won't use that room anymore um that's kind of the household that i grew up in so like if our our sink stopped working we we just used the bathroom sink instead so there was a point in time where there was like five or seven years where um our our kitchen sink just wasn't used Mm. Uh, yeah it's it, it it was rough how does it feel to talk about things like that, Des? Honestly, it, it feels it feels like past trauma, right? Where like I, I went through this, I've talked with with normal, like not normal, numerous therapists about my experiences growing up as a kid, that kind of like trauma and stuff, and it it is what it is. It it happened. It sucks, but focus on the now. Yeah, yeah. I can sort of, I, I can sort of detect your um, the imprint of therapy and all the work that you've done in the way that you talk about it. You know, I, I think that there's. I'm hearing a lot of acceptance. I'm not hearing a whole lot of excuses or defensiveness. Um, which is, which is interesting because a lot of times, you know, when people will talk about their upbringing and like, or the negative things that potentially their parents or loved ones used to do, there'll be a lot of like caveats, excuses, you know, balancing the equation. Oh, my parents did love me a lot, things like that, you know, and, and I'm not really hearing a whole lot of that from you, which doesn't, you know, I'm not getting the sense that your parents were, um, abusive or neglectful. I mean, maybe they were, but like, you know, I'm not. I'm not, I think it, it sounds like there were just a lot of challenges in the household. You know, it yeah, sounds um, like some of your caregivers could have done a better job. It, it's definitely one of those tough things. My mom, she, single mom, all of that. My, my father, uh, who I actually finally got to meet for the first time when I turned 30, which was interesting. Hmm. Um, he was, he was in prison and stuff. So it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it is what it is. It's best to focus on the now because, yeah. like, you can't do anything to fix the past. You can do plenty to fix the present. Yeah. What I'm hearing is that you kind of spawned in a rough location. <laughs> <laughs> that that puts it well, yeah, actually. <laughs> didn't, didn't really get a winning spawn there, but yeah, that, but you got to play from it, right? Like, wherever you spawn, you got to, you know, you got to exactly, work with what right? you got. Absolutely. And I feel I am plus I mean, I feel like where where I spawned uh, resulted in me doing a lot of good. Yeah. I, I mean, hell, we've we've raised almost $50,000 for charity since I've started streaming, which is just wow. That's amazing, man. Like I, I never thought someone someone like me would be able to, to do so much good. And who is someone like you? disabled like struggling like i've always struggled to to do full-time employment that kind of thing where i've always just you know i never felt like i could connect or fit in or do anything and to to suddenly be able to be like oh no actually you found a place where things are working and you're actually doing a really good job at it 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 really changes it's one of the things i love about twitch Right, where in a lot of instances where you've struggled in the world, real world, especially as a disabled individual, to finally find a platform where your disability isn't as much of a limiter as it is in reality. Mm -hmm. I mean, streaming is reality, but you, you yeah. like the the real world, so to speak. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of interesting philosophical points there about you know what's the real world, what isn't. I'm curious, um, how do you feel about the term disabled? <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm personally fine with it. I I I understand that there's some some backlash around the the word and everything, but I mean, it, it's hard not to refer to it as a disability because I feel like it limits me in so many ways. Going for my master's program, that was a nightmare. I mean, academia in general, for for those of us with with disabilities, is almost an impossibility. And then adding in COVID into it, and I was completely wrecked. I, I couldn't even, I, I, I finished my master's program with a 4.0, but I couldn't finish writing my thesis because everything changed. And I just, it was like there, it just slipped through my hands. Hmm. Interesting. 
What What's made it hard? Can you help us understand, like you said, you've struggled to maintain full-time employment. What's made that hard? Um, a lot of it is focusing and maintaining a lot of the interactions, the, the social interactions, everything that goes in at work, understanding like the, the, the hierarchy and the systems that are there and the cliques and the groups in office politics. That's what they're called. Like, like navigating through all of that was, it basically felt impossible. Um, there are certain tasks that you're expected to be able to complete, like talking on a phone, um, I, I've learned ways around it, but it's difficult still. I really, 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 really hate phones. I do not like phones. They are such a just overwhelming sensory, especially phones ringing. And then, of course, you know, like like sometimes because a lot of workplaces, they don't give you you space. You're all kind of in like uh, enclosed. Sure. So things like um, like I, I used to have a a coworker who would like spam click their mouse to activate their computer. They just like click, 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 click. I could not get any work done. I would have, I would have noise canceling headphones and everything, or, you know, people come up behind you, start having full count conversations. There are so <laughs> many components in a workplace that, you know, neurotypicals or just normal individuals will be like, Oh, whatever. I'm like, Oh, I can just cancel that. I, I can't. Yeah. Um, and there, there's also like when when I reach these points of where I'm completely overwhelmed, like, hey, if I keep pushing myself, I'm going to have a meltdown. Work tends to not be a place where you can go ahead and get the flexibility necessary for that. Sure. Um, and that that's, again, one of the things that I love about streaming is it's like, hey, I've reached I'm like nearing that point where I'm overwhelmed. I'm going to have a meltdown and I can just stop. Like it's sorry. Go ahead. Hey, no, no, no. I was gonna say, have you played Darkest Dungeon? I have not. I've always wanted to, but I, I've never actually started. It's interesting because hearing I've never used a Darkest Dungeon analogy on stream before, but hearing kind of like your workplace environment, like I don't know if you are familiar with the mechanics, but you know you have an HP pool like any other RPG, and then like essentially magic does stress damage. And so this is like a reverse HP pool where like it goes from zero to 200. And if you hit 200, you die. And then like once you hit 100, like your character gets like a pretty significant debuff. What I'm almost hearing from you is that there's like this stress, like it's just like Darkest Dungeon where there's stuff that like racks up your stress. And then if it hits a certain point, like you have a meltdown and you can even kind of use a lot of your like cognitive energy or mana pool to like suppress or like kind of keep that stuff buried but it's still like building up in the background and if you force yourself into these situations you can kind of last for some amount of time but i it sounds like you know that meltdown or burnout as you mentioned you mentioned something about like coping mechanism burnout um I forget what the term you used, but you said that you had like the, all of your oh, oh, the uh, autistic burnout. Yeah. Uh, um, and and so it's it's bizarre, but that's kind of what I'm hearing. Is that kind of fair that like you could manage it for a while, but it really wouldn't get better. And then you sort of it was too much for you to handle. Yes, I think that's a good comparison. Um, specifically, like it it's we can kind of push ourselves. And this is one of the things that I had to learn in my, my master's program is how often I had to say no, because if we push ourselves, like I, I don't like hitting myself in the head. Like it's, it's one, it's, it's not a pretty thing to see. And two, it's not very good for myself. And so I, I had to start learning to say no more often even though like I wanted, right? Like I wanted to play everything. I wanted to get my master's degree. I wanted to, to succeed in academia. Mm. I, I understood that I, I had to just stop. Otherwise, like it would just get worse and worse. And these, these meltdowns, like the, the more I have them, the more I push myself, the, the worse that it would get. Yeah. Des, what's it like to want something so much and not be able to do it? it sucks um i think we can all kind of relate to that um 
But I think it's also something that we all have to come to terms with, that the the notion that we can become anything isn't a reality. And that sometimes it's best to pay attention to what we can do and to strengthen that rather than climb an impossible wall. And I know that I, I can, you know, get my master's, I can get my doctorates, but it's going to be about finding um finding a program and thing that works with me. Des bro, I think how did you learn that? Because I think like 99% of people out there, like arguably myself included, you know, have trouble learning the lesson of like, I want this so much, but I may not be able to get it. How do you believe get that me. acceptance? Believe me, once you punch yourself in the head enough times, you learn. <laughs> <laughs> um, seriously, though, like like when when you reach those points where you, you feel yourself breaking, you realize something's going to, to give, right? And I, I think that's kind of one of the, at least the, the positive things is um, learning that it was like, I can't keep doing this. I got to find another way. The best way to describe my experiences is it's like trying to Kool-Aid man through a bunch of walls and eventually you can't Kool-Aid through the wall. So you have to find a way around it. Yeah. And well yeah. Beautifully said. Des, you know, it's it's also kind of interesting. I, let me just think about this. Because you mentioned the cycle, which I think is really important to understand, um, which is like, you know, once you Kool-Aid man through a wall or, or, you know, once you fail at something that you really want, it actually causes you to try to Kool-Aid your way through more walls, right? You dig deeper. There's some amount of shame there's some amount of lack of acceptance. There's some amount of attachment and wanting it that you kind of like, you like burn out even more. Like you try even harder, you dig deeper, you push yourself more because that's what we're sort of taught to do, right? Like don't ever give up. And where there's a will, there's a way. And then, so then what happens is, and the, the crazy thing is that you can Kool-Aid your way through a wall, right? You can smash through things by digging deep. And then what happens is people like, they dig deep and then they like, they do it. They sort of succeed, even though they're like cannibalizing themselves from the inside. And then they say, okay, this works, right? Because then they've been able to do it. And then they got what they wanted. And they're sort of not really paying attention to the cost. And then they think to themselves, oh, I can do this. This is possible. And that's almost what I find to be like the most damning thing, because it's sort of like, yeah, it's possible, but what did you have to pay you know what's the price that you pay to get to where you are and then if they fail again the whole cycle repeats and they're like oh if i had dug deeper if i had sacrificed more if i had done more if i wasn't just so messed up like if if all of these things and then like the cycle repeats and it repeats and repeats and what i'm curious about is you know when when you are able to push yourself and actually accomplish things and then like when you fail and you sort of like, how did you get, get out of that cycle? You know, like, because I, I can sort of see it going both ways. One, which is like, you need to do better. If you did better, you could do it. Versus recognizing, oh, actually, like, maybe I can't do that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really hard to say. Honestly, the best way, like. The, the past, uh, ever since the diagnosis, which is it's been almost four years now, I feel especially like every, well, honestly, the past five years have been a blur. Like ever since I graduated college, everything's just kind of, it's, it's I don't know, like the, the, the ability to grasp like what's happened feels less tangible than it did when I was younger. Mm. Um, but... What I do know is each time I reach the breaking point, each time I hit a wall, um, it got harder and harder to kind of break through and to keep going. And I, I know that eventually I was it was hurting myself to, to just bash into the wall. Um, and so I had to I had to start thinking about it more critically. I had to look at the wall and, you know, sometimes there there actually happens to be a door right next to the wall. <laughs> sometimes I sometimes I have to, to, you know, maybe get scaling gear or, 
you know, whatever their various option, because I was literally like I was literally killing myself, so to speak, by constantly running into these walls. I think one of the, the things that makes it more apparent for those of us with disabilities is that we run into them more frequently, mm. which the more frequently that you run into it, you're going to be more aware. Yeah. Whereas if it happens like, you know, every six months, every year, you might fall into that same trap where you, you I just got to dig deeper. I just got to dig deeper. So I really think that contributed a lot is that it's that when you have these problems, you run into them more frequently and you, you learn faster, so to speak. Yeah, that's that, it's so wise and also a little bit damning because kind of what I'm hearing for your answer is like, you know, oh, Des, like, how did you guys, you know, figure out how to wipe rag? I mean, uh, how to down Ragnaros? And it's like, yeah, I wiped a whole lot. Like other people may wipe every six months to a year, but I wipe like once a week. And and it, it's really hard to say, but uh, or, or to listen to and to really think about. But I, I do think that there's a lot of value to sort of like recognizing that maybe you're just like more experienced at wiping. And and I don't know what that means for people who are neurotypical who encounter things less frequently, but I'm certainly detecting a lot of like, you know, awareness on your part and, and critical thinking and sort of recognizing who you are, accepting yourself for who you are, um, separating out maybe what you should be from what you are. Um, and I think in, in some ways it sounds like you started that process very young because you noticed when you were young that like you were different from other people. And Absolutely. So, um, what have been? How did you feel about getting an autism diagnosis, or what was that like for you to get diagnosed with autism? It was a major relief, to be honest. Um, it was it was a struggle. Uh, the the therapist and kind of everything. They don't like diagnosing adults as autistic. Um, they they don't really see, or at least my therapist didn't really see that the resources were useful to diagnosing an autistic adult. Um, that you were seen as like taking resources away from autistic children. That that's something that could be you know benefiting someone that they could help. Because once you're an adult, there's there's no support network. There's nothing that can really be done. Um, which is part of what led me into charity because that's that's literally horrifying to to realize. Yeah. Okay, you invest so heavily in autistic children, and then it's just like, well, it's someone else's problem now, right? It's like be building a beautiful garden, and it's like, ah, eh, we'll let the weeds take over, right? Like, mm -hmm. it just it makes no sense. So getting that diagnosis not only gave me ease of mind and understanding of who I was, but it also connected me with the autistic community, being able to connect with other autistics that have had similar experiences, to be able to, to be a part of a network where I finally felt a sense of belonging, which like I, I think a lot of that, that, um, that psychological usefulness is missed in these diagnoses because they're, they're, it's super important. It's really important to, to be able to have that connection, to have that belonging, to know that you're not alone, to, mm. to go from feeling like there, there's no one else like you, no one else going through the problems that you're going through, to suddenly like, holy shit, there's, there's other people out there that, that understand. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like you had felt alone for a long time. And now I'm, I'm sort of hearing you say a lot about being able to connect to other people, but... I, uh, other people I've worked with have also sort of emphasized that they had a reason for why things were the, the way they were, right? Because people like uh, my experience with people with autism, just listening to them is that they just feel so broken, like arbitrarily, because it's not, there isn't like a diagnosis or reason or rhyme or like, you're just, you're just bad at making friends. There's like something fundamentally busted and you just suck at it. There's no like explanation. There's no reason. There's no like you know, and, and, and for some people who get an autism diagnosis, they sort of understand that what I have always experienced, which is that it's hard for me to live life like neurotypical people do, actually has like a neurological or neuroscientific correlation to it. There are parts of my brain that literally function in a different way from like what a neurotypical person's brain functions like. 
And so it's not like some kind of moral deficiency or being weak or just sucking or like a charisma stat that's like low. It's that you're wired differently. Did that yes. sort of uh, have an impact for you in that way or was it mostly about connection? Uh, no, definitely like finally having that answer and understanding. Um, absolutely. Like I, I've focused on the connection because I, I think that it's a really important thing because I, I think many of us with autism, we desperately want social connection. That was like one of the big misunderstandings that I had about autism before getting my diagnosis was that if if you wanted to have friends, if you wanted that social interaction, that you couldn't be autistic because autistics weren't weren't sociable, which is, it's simply not the case. And there was there was like a lot of these kind of um, uh, this misinformation out there that I had to search through to better understand what autism was when I went to seek my my diagnosis. And and can you help us understand a little bit about the sort of this? I can imagine it's tricky because on the one hand, it can be hard to make social connections and wanting social connections and what it's like kind of swimming through those waters. A lot of it, like one of the big things that I struggled with growing up as a kid is noticing when I was being annoying, right? Like I would talk about something I'm very passionate about, something that I care about and realizing that the other person was annoyed, bored or whatever in trying to like now now like i have all this anxiety and i'm like i'm constantly watching like facial interactions i'm watching body language like there's this huge anxiety where i'm like okay i need to change the subject to the point that even even if someone is enjoying the conversation i'm ready to jump that like that conversation like oh wait i've been talking about this for three four five minutes okay mm -hmm. i need to change subject even if they are liking it because it's it's almost like the script that plays in my head um yeah like like a lot of those that kind of like trying to figure it out was just it was constant like okay i didn't get the reaction i wanted or okay this didn't happen the way it was try again let's change one thing i mean it, it, i i definitely relied on science a lot on like things like scientific method to to be able to go and experiment and like okay we'll try this one little tweak we'll try this tweak we'll try this tweak until i ended up with a script that was somewhat successful yeah and it, it sounds very intensive from an energy standpoint yes it's it can be exhausting yeah and and that you know once you came up with your algorithm that like even if the conversation organically didn't require a shift there's a part of your brain that has learned that after four minutes about talking about a subject the safest thing to do is to switch the subject yes yeah and but really, and I know you use the term sociopathic, but I think, um, you know, I think that it's somewhat apples and oranges, but I am hearing a lot that you make, like a lot of your social interactions are calculated and and not out of a desire to like take advantage of anyone, but just because I, I think what I'm also hearing from you, and this is my experience working with people with autism, is that you know, some of the empathic circuitry that allows people to like naturally like know how to swim is is not quite intact. And so you have to rely, you have to figure out other ways. I, I, I just had another analogy, which maybe is devastating and offensive, but sort of like a duck without feathers. You're still a duck, but like some of the things that you normally allow you to float, like you have to learn how to like swim in a different way. Um. And and so it sounds it sounds really tough, man. Yeah, uh, you you mentioned specifically about not trying to take advantage of others. I growing up before I knew I was autistic, that was one of the big things that I dealt with a lot. Was um, like because of how I approached everything and thinking about it to try and elicit specific responses. I I like I had this this big fear that I was deliberately trying to take advantage of people. Right. Because it was literally how to, how I had to solve all of my problems. Like I had to do this, like this, this component that came so natural to everyone else. I had to go on all this deliberate and like thinking about each of these components where I literally felt like I was manipulating others mm. and it, it sucked. It, it definitely had a huge kind of negative mental toll on sure. that.
I, I can completely understand that. I think, <laughs> unfortunately, um, you know, that's not necessarily the case. And I've, I've met um, a ton of people who are very emotionally, like, not overly cognitive and at the same time are also incredibly manipulative. Like, it's not that thinking very cognitively about social uh, interactions makes you manipulative or not. I've seen, you know, both versions of that. And, and Des, I'm curious, you mentioned that you're you're married. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about how that happened? Because I know that's something that's very anxiety provoking for a lot of people with autism, like romantic um, relationships. So I actually it's it's kind of silly how it kind of fell into my lap, so to speak. Um, I I didn't really have any relationship experience until I was. 22 um when i was 22 i um i i this this sounds really bad uh i basically found a situation where i could rely on my looks to be able to bypass romantic or the the kind of romantic interactions to lose my virginity um so i i had to go through this this kind of like cold calculation to be able to um, find myself in a position to be able to to go through that because I wanted to 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 solve that problem. I'm sorry, I'm looking at chat. Don't want. <laughs> God damn it! Yes, you can't look at chat, bro. <laughs> what the shit? Sorry, I. I, Everyone oh wants to know how you did it. I want to know, but you can't look at chat. You are on a roll. When you're socially awkward and you're not, even if you're not neurotypical, imagine all the neurotypical people with social anxiety who think that they're incels and aren't even on the spectrum. And here you have the answer for them. And you get distracted by chat. <laughs> Just let, let's put it on the ADHD part as well. Um, but yeah, it, it is. Um, so that, that whole situation, I, I basically, it, it kind of allowed me to, I don't know, I've admit my way through it. So like, like relationships are really like fine tasks where you need like, you know, like you need to be able to like, be able to move everything just right for it to go through. And I specifically reference oven mitt because that's what it feels like interacting with social circumstances. It's this very um, dexterous, fine tuned interaction and we have oven mitts. So it's, it feels really hard to, to be able to piece through that. And it, it worked. Um, I like looking back on it, I feel bad. Um, cause it definitely feels like a situation where I may have manipulated someone, um, into a romantic relationship in order to, um, meet that, right. It's, it's not a, it's not a nice thing. At least I don't consider it a nice thing. Um, but it allowed me to kind of get past that, that big fear when you're a virgin, which is, what happens when you do get to that point, right? It completely changed the kind of dialogue and interaction for me. Uh, can, can you help me understand? I, 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 I find myself being curious about, you know, what... Yeah, I just have so many questions. Like, can you just share more about that? I'm serious, because I, like, I, I, I think, it, you know, doing something because you want to get laid, like I can sort of understand where you're coming from there, but I think just as equally as important is like illustrating or helping people understand what felt unethical about for you about that, what felt manipulative for you, how you came to that realization. I feel like there's actually a lot of all the memes and stuff aside. I think there's, there's a lot of important wisdom here. So mainly what made it feel manipulative is for the individual like i i didn't really care specifically about them that it was kind of a, a means to an end i mean they they were obviously interested and wanted to engage in everything so it's, it was mutual but for me my understanding of sexual interaction has always been based around things like love 
right? That that very romantic nature. So utilizing it to not utilizing love, but utilizing sex to kind of understand was ethically problematic to me, I think. Hmm. Um, Interesting. Because, uh, you know, to play devil's advocate for a second, I mean, you were the one who was there. So I, uh, but I, I'm sort of, you know, my understanding of, of sex and love is that the two don't necessarily have to go hand in hand. And that especially if you're a 22 year old, you know, like a little bit of figuring it out as long as, and it sounds like the other person was like interested in consenting and all, you know, that's, that's the really important stuff to me. But, uh, you know, I, I, I want to say that like, I don't want to discourage people from figuring it out because at 22 you're not going to know exactly what the relationship is between sex and love right right like you're just not and and so i i'm not hearing anything so far that seems kind of unethical to me except maybe some expectations that you had but or that you knew yeah. you maybe were not that much like rom- potentially romantically into this person but um i i feel like i utilize them not for sex but for what sex meant, which is why I think this became a little bit more unethical to me. Hmm. I don't know. It, it's one of those things where when you're 22, um, it, it makes sense. But like looking back on it, I, I basically treated it kind of like a science experiment rather than like the, the kind of like sexual experience. Right. It was about seeing what it was about getting through that and kind of removing it as a factor rather than um, rather than just trying to get laid. Interesting. OK. And how did you meet your you said that your current relationship sort of fell into your lap? So I I met. Um, I met my wife through a friend that I was able to make thanks to, you know, sitting in bars, constantly watching language. Uh, it turns out they were like a big metalhead. So we, 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 oh God, it was amazing. Like finally, this was one of those scripts where I didn't have to change the conversation every four minutes. We would talk about metal for like hours and hours and hours. Like, oh, we, we loved metal. Um, but eventually he told me about this this uh, girl that he had met. She was getting her bachelor's in neuroscience. I wanted to get my bachelor's in neuroscience. And so we we um, we started talking on Facebook, all of that. She was currently seeing someone else. And, you know, as we talked more and more, I, um, I, I basically just laid out my feelings for her and talked like, you know, about how like I, I cared for her and all of that. Um, and things just ended up working out. She ended up breaking up with the, the other guy who happened to be super abusive. Um, we, we shared our first kiss August 11th. Um, and it's, I don't know. Like, I, I think because I spent so much time analyzing every single situation, having to be super aware of where I was cognitively, where I was emotionally actually ended up preparing me for that relationship. So when we ended up in this, I was very quick to, um, I was very quick to be like, Hey, this is problematic or Hey, this is bothering me or Hey, I don't like this. And we would actually talk about things before they became a problem. Um, I, I definitely do see like a lot of my experiences as an autistic having been beneficial, even unknowingly, because of how much I had to rely on observing literally every single detail. Yeah, it it sounds like you know I'm 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 purposely avoiding chat because I <laughs> I can only imagine you know all the messages about your autism and chadness rolled into one. But I I think it's great because I think it sort of illustrates something really really important, which is that um, what I'm really hearing from you is that you took a lot of risks, right? So I, I'm, I'm not, when you sort of confessed your feelings for her, had y'all met in person? Um, we, we had met in person. Um, we had met a couple of times. Uh, and this is still when I was trying to figure out how relationships worked. So, you know, like the whole, you know, oh, you should, you should ignore women. That makes them want you. Like, like all of those kind of like, really kind of crappy information that's out there for when you're young and trying to somehow cipher wisdom from all of that in in some form to to interact in relationship. 
And so what do you think is useful to make a relationship? So it sounds like y'all are married now. Yes. So, um, I, I honestly, I got lucky. I'm, I'm going to be real honest. I, I, I don't know how it happened. It's, it's like, it's like doing that jump in a video game. You do it once and you have no idea how you did it and you can never do it again. <laughs> that, that is literally like, it's just everything lined up. I, I don't know. Um, but what I will say, as far as it lasting, we've been married for over, we've been together eight years. We've been married six. Um, communication is so incredibly important is if the other, if the other person doesn't know where you're at, they can't work with you. And she didn't know I was autistic when, um, we, we got married and all that. We didn't find out until years later. And there were points where, you know, it looked like we might get divorced, but communication, having a conversation around there and understanding like yeah this is this sucks this is problematic we weren't quite expecting this but um we got through it because we we talked we understand she knows how much i love her how much i care about her um i i do what i can to try and help out even though i struggle in so many other ways like being being married to someone who isn't able to to bring in like full-time work or isn't able to bring in lots of money is difficult but um communication really helps yeah i'm glad you said that because i think that's what i'm hearing is different um so i i think that uh, you know sometimes people feel like they don't they can't bring value to a relationship and I know you say, frankly, it was luck or so therefore it was RNG. And I certainly feel the same way about my relationship in terms of getting really, really lucky. But I do think that, you know, there are a lot of really interesting things kind of objectively, Des, about your relationship and how it evolved. And I think there are a lot of lessons to take away for people. So here's what I'm hearing you, you know, this is, this is what your character sheet shows, right? So you were born with the autism trait, which is like, comes with like, charisma penalties and and things like that like it's hard for you to socially interact with people it can be really challenging and let me know if this sounds offensive at some point okay um and then also that like some of your disability prevents you from doing things like working full-time and things like that and so on, on paper you know i think a lot of people will look at that and will say like if if people are in your shoes like i could only imagine being you know a 24 year old person with autism who's unable to hold a full-time job and to think to myself that I'm not worthy of having a relationship. I can't ever be in a relationship. Um, and yet what I'm hearing from you is that ultimately like you can actually have a very successful relationship and that as important and as it's hard, right? So there's some amount of shame and expectation and societal stuff and whatnot, but at the end of the day, that like communicating with your partner and like letting people know where you're at, letting people like owning up to what your shortcomings are and trying to support them the best that you can, that like you can talk about things and like let people know where you're at. And, and I think another thing that you're not really mentioning, I, I'd imagine you're very good at listening. And, and also like, you know, what people sometimes what the, the trickiest thing that I see in terms of like marriage counseling, I don't do a whole lot of it, is that a lot of people make sacrifices and then feel resentful. And then their partner says, I never asked you to make that sacrifice. Right? So like, I'll make a big sacrifice and then I'll feel owed because I made this big sacrifice. And then the person on the other side of the table is like, I never asked that of you. And then we get into this really tricky impasse because, you know, one partner feels really owed because they've given something up. And then on the other side, the other partner was like, I didn't buy that thing, so I don't owe you anything. You know, I never asked for that sacrifice. And so what I'm kind of hearing from you, I, I'm reading between the lines here, is that I think you guys probably did a really good job. It's not about making the sacrifice or not making the sacrifice or being able to be full-time employed or having autism or not having autism. It's about ultimately being on the same page about where you guys are, whether it's in a good place or a bad place. And I'm hearing you say that, you know, you all have talked about divorce, which sounds like very understandable because it sounds like there are a lot of challenges that y'all face in your relationship, just like any other relationship, and that you guys have an additional layer of challenge because on some level, 
you know, there are a lot of things that society expects from you that you may not be able to do. And let me know if this feels mean at some point. I'm not really, I, I think it's, it actually is like a shining example of how so many of what we assume about a successful relationship, I don't think is actually what makes a successful relationship. It's not Absolutely. having a particular career. It's not, it's like really about being on the same page and it doesn't, it sort of doesn't matter. Like, I mean, it, it matters, but to me, the most crucial thing I've seen, you know, two neurotypical people who have successful careers and are very charismatic who have gotten divorced. And I think the problem is like, they're not on the same page. And I've seen a lot of people who feel hopeless because of certain disadvantages they have that they're unable to find love or sex. But what I'm really hearing from you is that like, you know, that it's possible to have both of those things as long as you really focus on self-awareness, attending to another person's needs, being somewhat transparent about what your needs are. These are the kinds of things that I, I'm really hearing have led to your success. What do you think? Uh, absolutely. I, I think spending so much time observing, studying, being aware of, recognizing, I, I think all of these things have played an important and critical role in my own success with relationships. Um, I mean, it's, it's like any subject, the more you study it, the better you get at it. You might not, um, like, like I, I didn't, I didn't just I wasn't suddenly born with my understanding of neuroscience. I had to study it. I had to go through it. I had to take classes. And then, you know, I was able to, to actually start to understand it. And so for a lot of normal individuals out there, they might have all this understanding already kind of pre-built in. Whereas for, for myself, I had to study it and study it and study it. And I think it paid off. Yeah. Well said, Dust. Um, so... I had a couple of other, uh, like, so I, I really appreciate everything you've shared with us. I'd love to hear a little bit about ABA activism, what's going on with, with autism, if you want to talk about that. Um, you know, I think there are a couple of other things that you mentioned, which I think are like really, really important for people to hear, like this concept of love being withheld based on your behaviors. Is there a particular direction you want to take things, Des? <sighs> Um, so, um, like this is, this is a really important conversation for the autistic community since ABA is, is generally considered abuse by our community. Um, and on the idea of like the old school ABA being a way of withholding love, withholding attention, withholding certain characteristics and why I compared earlier, like giving myself ABA. Um, for, for those asking why what ABA is, it's, it's basically, um, put, put the simplest way not to, to downgrade what it is or to downgrade ourselves. It's, it's Pavlovian, right? Whereas like you give a reward or you give a negative response to elicit a specific response, a specific behavior. And in the instance where I was talking earlier about with my uncle is my uncle would do an action. Um, i.e. respond negatively to the um, clinking noise of a bowl, right? My response would be, okay, I'm not going to react to that because I don't want that added that added pain because they'll keep clinking the bowl in a, in a response to his annoyance. So that is a negative reinforcement that tells me not to elicit that behavior. This is similar to what we've seen in a lot of ABA. It's changed since then, I've been told. Um, but there's still a lot of problems, especially like positive reinforcement can still be problematic if you're getting a behavior to respond that causes harm. Um, for example, uh, I once had a, a meltdown, not one that resulted in me hitting myself, but I threw my phone and ended up running into a wall um, because a professor touched the lip of my can. So I had a can um, and their, their hand touched the, the part where you drink from, which caused me to become every, very overwhelmed. It's something that's very stressful and, and painful for me. But ABA would see this behavior as problematic and would expose me to it constantly until I didn't respond in a negative way. So what, what, what's... What is the problem you see with that? 
um, uh, it elicits pain as a way of um, no longer performing that behavior. Rather than acknowledging the the needs of the individual and what is going on, I you know ask the person to move the can versus moving the can yourself. It it puts the burden on the autistic to suffer rather than creating a situation where no one is suffering. That, that's a good point. I'm not sure if people were, um, I, yeah, so, so that, that's a good point. So can I share like a similar experience that I've had sort of uh, as a treatment yes, professional? Go ahead. So I was working with a, a young guy with misophonia. So misophonia is a neurological disorder where like, Something is messed up where, so normally when we hear a sound, like, you know, sound hits our eardrum and then that, you know, the sound travels via a neuron to our auditory cortex, then travels to our auditory association cortex. So like I'm able to hear sounds, but if I use words, for example, your brain does not interpret words as sounds, it interprets words as words. So that comes from your auditory association cortex. So something is, I, we don't know exactly what happens in misophonia, but there are some sounds that elicit like pain. Like, so instead of, you, you know, like the, the hearing a particular sound is like the experience of like rubbing, you know, like this person described it to me as like rubbing like an open wound with sandpaper. And so like literally sounds will hurt them. And so the interesting thing, this is, uh, unfortunately, this person is, is older now. And so like back in the day, they went to go see a neurologist who would essentially do exposure therapy and was like focused on like making this person more resilient. And they're like, you know, much like exposure therapy, like what we're going to do is expose you to the sound until your neurons acclimatize to it. And so what this person sort of discovered is that like they didn't ever acclimatized to it because it's sort of like you know it doesn't matter how many times you get kicked in the nuts like it's gonna hurt every time there's no like acclimatizing to getting kicked in the nuts and so the bizarre thing the, the reason they wound up in my office is they were so traumatized by the treatment that they sort of developed ptsd and a personality disorder as a result like chronic ptsd so to see PTSD personality disorder it sort of completely changed the way that they like interacted with like so like they started to think of like doctors and parents like it was really confusing because they understood oh this doctor is trying to help me and like my parents are trying to help me but like they're hurting me a ton and they won't stop and they won't stop ever and they they tell me that every time I get hurt that like I need to be stronger and it completely reshaped the way that they looked at their like important relationships caused a ton of problems. And I think the re the way we were able to make progress is, is through recognizing that, you know, early on when you were like six years old, these people who were supposed to protect you actually would like take you once a week and rub sandpaper over your open wounds. And what do you think that does to a child when it happens like clockwork once a week? for an hour, for a decade. And, and, and it's really kind of terrifying that like a lot of times I think, unfortunately, as treatment professionals, um, there's a lot of iatrogenic, which means like, you know, treatment induced injury. Um, and it's really sad. But just, to, you know, I, I get what you're saying. I, I didn't, yeah. I didn't realize this about ABA, though. So it's, it's good to know. Yes, there, there's been talks about changes. I um, recently read an article that came out in 2021. Um, and from there, like the argument that ABA has changed, it's still argued as unethical because the practitioners are, um, are working outside of their scope as well, i.e. that they're not experts on autism and that to, to treat a neurological disorder uh, from a psychological perspective, is also troublesome because it's it's not it can't be solely confined by behavior. So it's kind of outside of the scope of the individual to not have experience with autism, um, like like to actually be like an expert on autism. So they can't even notice like if the autistic individual is in pain 
right? Because we we don't display our our pain, we don't display our trauma in the same way that neurotypical individuals will. Mm. So it's very problematic to say that well they're not they're not being hurt. It's like anyone can say that. It's like well that they're not being hurt. It it doesn't mean that you can't. Or it, just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah. I mean, don't get me started there. Because it's it's like such an uphill battle to try to explain to people who think that they're experts that they're not experts. Like the one lesson that I've come away with, uh, Des, like just personally as a clinician, is that I can have all the training in the world, but every person I meet is an individual. And th when I run into trouble is when I start th uh, when I start thinking about myself as an expert. And when someone comes to me and says, you don't know what you're talking about, like, I've learned how to listen to what they're saying, no matter where I trained, no matter how much experience I have. Because this is the bizarre thing about medicine is like, you know, we, t we, we use like these protocols and paradigms, but like literally every human being is unique. And so I don't know as a system of medicine why we don't sort of like acknowledge or factor that into our day-to-day -day operations. But I think it's really hard to explain to people who believe themselves to be experts that, you know, you may not know as much as you think. There's a lot of like professional hubris, certainly within medicine. I think we see it a lot in, in especially unfortunately in mental health, because you'll have a lot of people who are, you know, I, I think I, I have a bias here, so, you know, I have to sh kind of share that. But it's my belief that a lot of our mental health is actually physical in nature. Um, there's a lot of evidence of this nowadays. But if you look at like, for example, you mentioned the fight or flight response, right? That's a physiologic response. And so I, I don't know how much therapy is going to help. I, I mean, I think therapy can help a lot with that kind of stuff. But I think that therapists, if they ignore the physiologic component of your, your autistic meltdown, they're going to be do doing you a disservice. The challenge is that most therapists are not trained in physiology. Um, right. And and we see this a lot too in terms of of physical medicine as well where medical doctors who are not trained in psychology will like ignore the symptoms of their patients because they think that they're psychological so like everyone's guilty of it you have medical doctors that are ignoring the psychological component and you have psychologists who are ignoring the physical component um and and i think the unfortunately like the problem is like the person who gets screwed is the patient um which is sad and I, yeah. I've just seen a lot of professional hubris, like, and I don't think it helps people. Like, I don't think it does right by our patients. So I don't know what I'm trying to say there, but. No, I, I, I completely understand what you're, what you're getting across. It definitely is a problematic situation. Damn it. There was something I actually, I wanted to say on that <laughs> too. That was really, really important. Oh no, damn it. This is, this is the problem with the ADHD brain as well. We have that thought, but we didn't write it down. So it's, it's just, it's gone. Well, next time just interrupt. <laughs> I know you've trained yourself See, I've not been to. taught not to interrupt I, them. I knew That's it. the yeah, problem. It's, yeah. it's... So, so I, I know you've trained yourself not to, but like, I think next time interrupt, you know, it's, um, let me try to run through the sequence. So we were talking a little bit about and see if we can catch it again even if it slipped away. So uh, you had talked a little bit about how ABA is still unethical. I shared the story about misophonia, how a lot of times treatment can actually be like iatrogenically injuring, that we're trying to help people and we actually end up hurting them instead. Um, and then I talked, I ranted a little bit about professional hubris and a big problem that I see in sort of mental health treatment, which is that, uh, you know, men yeah. There you go. Autonomy. Autonomy. It's the idea that those with mental health issues don't have it. And so that these experts feel like they have a power of authority over the individual because they, they, they're not as seen as having autonomy. It's one of the big issues that we face as autistics is that we're emphasized. Things like the the puzzle piece, puzzle piece, and how all these little different components. It gives people the idea that we can be spoken over because we're not capable of speaking for ourselves. I think it's only approximately thirty percent 
of autistics have an intellectual disability. So there's still a large portion of the autistic community that is capable of, I mean, not even those with intellectual disabilities. They can still speak for themselves. They might just need more help to be able to do so. But that 30% is what's seen rather than the entire autistic community. And it's, it's sadly not just us, as I was mentioning, it's the entire mental health as well, where you lose that autonomy as soon as you're seen as having a disability. Um, a good example is individuals in wheelchairs. People will go around and push them in the wheelchair if they're in the way. They'll invade their, their space above their head like it, that, that kind of individual control is gone. I've never heard of the phrase. I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense, but I've never heard the phrase invade the space above your head, <laughs> their head. You know, it's, it's, it, I never think about like when I think about my personal space. I mean, I, you know, I, I haven't sat in a wheelchair, but I'm just appreciating for a moment that generally speaking, when I think about invasions of my personal space, I think about them in like horizontal directions. I don't really think about it in a vertical direction. I, I, I don't mean I mean, I'm laughing just because I don't know what else to do right now, but I, it's bizarre. Like, I, I can't imagine what it's like to, you know, have to worry about that space. And I feel lucky to not have to worry about that space. But it's 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 crazy. Um, yeah, I'm with you in terms of autonomy, though. And I think this is the, the other tricky thing. Yeah, so that, that's why I was kind of curious about, you know, this term disabled, because I see this a lot, too. I, and I think sometimes, yeah, it's tough, because I, I think we're quick to take away other people's autonomy. Um, I see this a lot too, where a lot of times we, like I see this with, with our community actually. And like when they talk to their parents, so we work on this a lot where people will say, you don't understand, right? So like the parents will say to the kid, like, you don't understand. Like, I wish, like, let me explain it to you. And it, it's like, no, like I'm allowed to understand and disagree. It's not that I don't understand. Like you're, you're kind of assuming that I'm ignorant. Whereas I just disagree. I'm allowed to have an opinion that is different from yours, and that doesn't make it objectively wrong. It's not a deficiency in my understanding. I see this a lot also in gender dynamics um, in, in terms of like sometimes, you know, people will like, especially towards women and within our community, um, you know, people will be like, oh, because you are a woman, therefore your opinion is worth less than someone else's. Like you, you need to understand or actually, I don't even know that it's even that conscious, but like I, I see this a lot where where disagreements are viewed as like a lack of understanding. Anytime there's kind of like this power dynamic, whether it's parents and kids or men and women or or whatever. Um, have you had personal experiences where you felt like you've been kind of shouted down or ignored because of your disability? Whew. I want to say yes, but... I'm not able to pull anything right out of the top of my head. Totally fine, man. Uh, okay. um, I know I've had to argue a lot with like psychiatrists and everything as well, just in general. Um, things like medication. It's one of the reasons why I pursued um, pharmaceutical sciences and stuff, because I wanted to have a bit more control over my own medication since like when it comes to like the pharmaceutical side, it's very it's not patient tailored because we we're not going into like genetics, et cetera, et cetera. So finding those right mediums were very difficult. And so I wanted to have some sort of authority in that conversation to be able to better treat myself versus where it's just, no, I'm, I know better. Yeah. That really pisses me off. Like, I, I think that I, I recently had a conversation with a patient of mine where, you know, it was a tough, it was a tough sort of impasse. Um, because I was sort of recommending a particular medication that they didn't like. And then ultimately, like, you know, at some point in the conversation, I was like, I'm not the one. It's easy for me to make this recommendation because I'm not the one who has to put that pill into my body on a daily basis. You know, and I think that's very easy to forget. Like we sort of think about, um, you know, what's like evidence based and scientific, but like as is pharmacologic prescribers like we're not the one who has to you know i have this book right and the book has a list of side effects and i'm like it can cause dry mouth it can cause weight gain it can cause erectile dysfunction but like i'm not the one who has to live with it right it's the patient who has to live with it and that's what makes it really really challenging and i think oftentimes as prescribers like it's one of the things that i 
try really hard to remember. Um, it's something that I don't think we emphasize enough. But I, I don't think that you should need to get formal training to be informed about medications. I think actually that's your right as a patient, and it's the responsibility of your doctors to equip you with the information to make an informed choice as opposed to overrule what you want to based on their authority. Like, do they know about it more than you do? Absolutely. But it's their job. Informed consent is like not about the consent. It's about the informed. Absolutely. Um, I, I do actually have an example as well. I went to uh, my friend's wedding and I had gotten lost. Um, I was in the actual wedding venue, but I guess I wasn't supposed to be there yet. And I, I told like the, this person came through and said like, Hey, you're not supposed to be here. Like he was like getting really aggressive with me. And so, you know, I, I went in and opened up immediately with, Hey, I'm autistic. I'm confused. I don't know where I'm supposed to be. And his response immediately was to see me as a child. He directly put his hands on me and it was like, there, there, bud. Like literally all of my autonomy in that instance was ripped from me rather than being like, hey, I might have some trouble interacting this conversation. I just need a little bit help. Like it was completely ripped from me and just like, like my personal space was invaded. My intellectual capability was invalidated. It, it sucked. Like, like I... I don't want to call it traumatic, but at the same time, it it felt disgraceful. You're good with words, Des. I, I paid words. a lot. I had to pay a lot of attention to words growing up. Um, yeah. Like there, there was times where like I, I think I spent days studying to understand metaphor similes stuff like that just because i wanted to have greater communication capability yeah I, I think you do a very good job i think you're you know we talk about alexithymia sometimes on stream I, i'd be really curious about how you learned how to put words to what you feel because i even saw like the gears turning in your mind there where you were like recalling the experience and trying to figure out what is the right word to describe how i felt um, and, and it was, yeah, you're good with words, man. It's cool. It's, it's, it, it's, it's a pleasure to hear you talk about stuff. Cause I think I'm happy paint, to hear that. Yeah. You, you, you're like, you're skilled with your words, like in terms of the way that you paint and you can paint a very clear picture because your words are quite precise. Um, do you want to talk about color on the spec, uh, color? Uh, I'm sorry. Did you have a response? I mean, I, I didn't mean to shift gears oh. on you there. But so color the spectrum is an event that's happening April 30th. That is really problematic for the, those of us on the autistic spectrum. Um, it's done by Mark Robber, and I'm sure it's, it's done with good intention. Uh, some of the language used, one of the like problematic things are things like my son will never be able to become an astronaut where there's a lot of this, like a lot of autistics and a lot of parents are hit with this immediately as soon as their child's diagnosed with autism, your son will never be able to do this. Your, your daughter will never be able to become this, right? There's a lot of, um, a lot of, I can't think of the word. There's a lot of qualifiers placed on what a person can and can't be as soon as they have a disability. Hmm. And I, this language is really harmful to the autistic community. Um, we were kind of, as mentioned, emphasized where we're seen as children. A lot of everything going on is from the perspective of parent to child rather than adult to adult or um, adult to child, right? I think that the, an adult to a child, that communication is different than a parent to a child. Um, and... Next for Autism is the charity that's being supported. Up until recently, they wanted to cure and prevent autism, which many of us in the autistic community feel is very... Um, they, they use eugenics. Um, I, I think that's a very, very powerful term. Um, I, I see it as saying you don't want me to exist. That autistics shouldn't exist 
because Racine is problematic. Um, of course, next racism um, came out with a, a whole thing like, oh, we never said that. This is this is just gross misinformation. And then they silently remove their their mission statement that actually include cure autism, etc., and just didn't talk about it. So they they basically gaslit the entire autistic community and just like, oh, don't listen to them. Well, um, so and sorry, go ahead. Can can I can I play devil's advocate for a second? Because now actually I'm a little bit confused. Devil's advocate means I'm supporting a point, but it's really con- I'm confused. So when I as a medical professional. When I think about a disability, I do certainly have a bias. Like, for example, when someone, you know, loses a let, or I, I maybe that has to do with losing. Um, I, I tend to think about restoration of function is an important part of my profession. And so when I think about someone with like a physical disability, like if someone had lost a hand, like I would think that it is a good move to for that person to no longer be disabled. Um, when I think about, you know, like I'll write letters for like medical disabilities for people with depression. I certainly, I mean, I personally like have a goal as a treatment provider to get that person to no longer be disabled. So now I'm a little bit confused about, um, and, and apologies if I'm, you know, coming across as like not understanding because I'm really confused now. Because when I th- when when you use the word disability, I think about something as I well, that word triggers in me the idea that something need, could could or eventually should be fixed. What do you think about that? I acknowledge that my the it, it is a disability it does limit what i can do and what i can accomplish but i think it's a disservice to also what it allows for us to do and for what it allows for us to accomplish right it's important to acknowledge is autism a disability because it's a disability or is it a disability because of society and mm-hmm. understanding how our ability to function in society makes it a disability that's a great and so point. there's there's a lot of that argument where it might not be something that needs to be cured or prevented because rather it should be about meeting us and understanding what we are or what we're dealing with rather than be like you don't fit let's fix you because that yeah, that yeah that that's super that, that's problematic very well said so i'm i'm going to kind of just riff off that for a second and talk about ADHD. So a lot of times when I work with people with ADHD, also as a clinician, I try really, really hard to not take the kid and make him successful. Don't default to making him successful at sitting in a classroom for eight hours a day. So, so my treatment, if you can call it that for ADHD is to try to structure an environment where their Vata mind. So they have a mind that's far more dynamic can handle a lot more varied stimuli and is not really suited to like staring at a book for four hours a day. So what I actually try to do with my patients with ADHD is not to turn them into people who can read books, but to help them structure an environment because I think that ADHD is actually like more of a natural, I mean, there's definitely a clinical illness in there, but I think there are too many people who get diagnosed with ADHD because their minds are not suited for a particular environment like school. So there's a really interesting bit of research that shows that as the student to teacher ratio gets worse, more kids get diagnosed with ADHD. So if you have one teacher in 10 students, very few diagnoses of ADHD. If you have one teacher in 50 students, like half the class is going to get diagnosed with ADHD. So I can totally get behind that. Did you want to say something? I actually, uh, I actually wish I had that kind of treatment growing up. I, for me, the only place I can actually study is in a classroom now. So I need like this, this very specific <laughs> environment. Anywhere else, I can't study. Yeah, it, it sucks. Yeah, I think it's it, it's also an interesting philosophical question about you know how much do we change who we are versus how much do we adapt or shape our environment to accommodate us. I'm curious, Des, and let me know if this question rubs you the wrong way. If I could give you a pill and and that would quote unquote cure your autism, would you take it? It's one of those hard things, right? It's like it it can't 
I can't quantify what part of me is autistic, right? That that's one of the big things, and like why we we tend to prefer autistic individual versus individual with autism is because we can't really separate that. We can't be like, oh, that's that's my autism part. Okay, bye. I don't like you. It, it's it's so much of who I am, and so to to cure my autism would mean eliminating who i am and so like i i i couldn't like ethically not just like not just because of like the other reasons but even ethically i would be deleting a part of myself hmm. interesting so uh can i disagree with you a little bit yeah sure you're, you're more than welcome to disagree all right so all respect but so this is where, like, I tend to be in the minority, and I, I realize what I'm about to say, like, may offend, like, millions of people. But, you know, it's weird, uh, Des, like, because it's hard, because what are you? Right? Like, I, I can understand exactly where you're coming from, but the more I've meditated, so a lot of what I'm saying comes from my experiences in meditation, where I've come to realize that core parts of my identity is not truly who I am. So I, I would potentially, for example, identify as a doctor, and I clearly do. And there's a part of me that feels like if you took my medical license away, I would not be me. But oddly enough, the more I've meditated, the more I've come to realize that even being a doctor is a false part of who I am. That the truest part of who I am is somewhat transcendent and cannot be reduced to a particular quality. I know it sounds weird, but like, like I, I don't think of myself. So it's, it's kind of bizarre. So I work with a fair number of people who are transgender too. And, and, you know, my approach to them is I can't tell if this is like really, really offensive or really, really accepting, but that their basic humanity is like, makes the core of who they are. And that that transcendent humanity is far more important than what their gender is. And some people get really offended by this, and we have that conversation, and other people really appreciate it. I'm not sure what's right or wrong. It's just been my experience in terms of discovering who I am. Because uh, there's a part... Yeah. Sorry, I don't think I follow. Doesn't that fit my statement? Because you, you said that... It may. Sorry. Yeah. So so that that's what's also kind of confusing. I think it's a different way of looking at identity, but like... I, I, there's a part of me that says that we could change a lot of things about you and you would still be you. Um, but what I'm hearing you say is that you consider your identity to be entangled with autism. And so removing the autism is removing a piece of you. Right. Like philosophically and somewhat neuroscientifically speaking, like our, our consciousness is our brain right we could argue that the structure of our brain plays a large role in our consciousness with autism being a neurological disorder the way that my brain is shaped is shaped so by my autism so to change that neurological component would be to change myself yeah so then my next question is is changing yourself a bad thing there is a difference between changing yourself in neuroplasticity and changing key components of your identity. Um, and in that, I, I can't think of a good example right now. There, there, there is superficial change that we all have that to some degree I think can be critical. Um, but at the, the identity of it all, it's the same. I think maybe this is a good example of Phineas, Phineas Gage. Uh, for those who don't know, Phineas Gage had a rod. He was a railroad, railroad worker. He had a rod go through his um, his job, basically. I can't think of the specific. Um, and went through the frontal cortex, which caused his entire behavior to change. Um, so he started gambling. He went from like this religious devout person to a gambling alcoholic. Very aggressive, very um, just very horrible person so to speak by comparison not saying that that is horrible but um was he still phineas gage right and like that that's a whole theory of like mind and what is and isn't i don't think i'm equipped to really have that that conversation 
But to, to my understanding is that I cease to exist when that changes. Yeah, so this is where things get a little bit tricky because, I, I, you know, it's, it's interesting, um, Des, because I, I get exactly where you're coming from. And I think autonomy is ultimately like what is most important. So I think you get to decide whether you like who you are and whether you want to change. I do think it's arrogant for an organization or for someone else, like including myself as a you know potential treatment provider, for me to decide what is right for my autistic patients. Like I don't get to make that decision; you get to make that decision. And and so I can get I, I can totally support you a hundred percent in terms of you know you saying that autism has shaped the person that I am, and I would it's I didn't hear you say yes or no if I offered you the pill. I, uh, I, 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 no, no. Okay. So I think that's totally fine. I think that's, that's ultimately, I think autonomy is tends to be the, the ethical principle that is a treatment provider. Like I try to value above everything else. Um, at the same time, I also find that I'm in the profession of trying to make people change that a lot of times people will come to me because there is a part of what they view as their core identity, which they do not like and which they want to change. And I think that's totally fine, too. Um, I know personally that um, a lot of my journey has been struggling to get away from my identity and discover who I truly am. Because I think a lot of our identity is like crafted and given to us. Right. Like you're like the identity that society gives you when you when you're at that wedding and you say to this person that I have autism and I'm confused. I'm not sure why I'm supposed to be the way that the world treats you, the way that the identity that like the world kind of hands you is one that I think sometimes we have to actually try really hard to get away from, because I think we also internalize some of that. So it's not just uh, you can arguably say, yeah, society's like society's wrong. But I think what we do is we internalize these things. Right. When we think about shame and stuff like that, we start to believe that we are, you know, when it comes to the chads and the, what, chads and the betas? Is it chad and beta? Is that the, what's the opposite of chad? Anyway. I I don't know. (laughs) So it's tricky, but I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that you, you answered the question. I I feel like I learned a lot and I, I think you've really helped me understand you said not people with aut- – because that's interesting because I've been told the opposite, that it's more offensive, that you so, shouldn't define a person by a particular diagnosis. That's the thing, right? Like, like as I was mentioning, since autism is a neurological disability, we are as much autistic as we are a person. We are an autistic person, right? Our, our identity can't be separated. I can't just be like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and take my autistic self. Now I'm going to just leave it at home. Now I'm going to be totally normal today. I, I, totally like, get I, that. I never can separate that. So I, I was taught the opposite by a different group of people with a different diagnosis. So, and I'm not saying one is right or wrong, but like just to share with you, like a, another conversation I had, I was talking with people with schizophrenia and in medicine, we have some uh, diseases that we define as the person. So we'll say so-and-so is a schizophrenic. Right. But there is no noun that involves cancer. So cancer is an illness like you're not defined by your cancer, like you get diagnosed with a cancer. I have a cancer. I'm not like a canceric. And so people like when I was kind of like talking to people with schizophrenia, what they were sort of saying to me is that they don't appreciate being defined by a particular illness or aspect of themselves. And that they think that the person is more important with schizophrenia because they're still a person. And the problem is that once you get labeled as a schizophrenic, you become a schizophrenic. You become a, uh, and I guess what they would say is you become an autistic in the eyes of others, but that your humanness is more important than your autism. But I understand both sides of the argument. I don't know. I I think when it comes to schizophrenic, it has a lot to do with the stigma. As we mentioned at the start of this, the individual with borderline personality disorder, these things have such negative connotations to them that you naturally don't want to be associated to that. You want to be seen as a person because what society sees when they hear hear these words are untouchable. Someone that just to to avoid. Um, Thankfully, that hasn't happened with autism yet. 
Okay. And so I think we have the ability to to take that word and make it a positive rather than trying to distance ourselves from negative connotations. Um, and so do you consider like if I were to, so you refer to yourself as an autistic individual, is that your preferred? Yes. And, and is the term, is there a noun form of person with autism? Is it an autistic? Yes. An autistic as an autistic. Okay. Um, so, so it, the, the, then the term autistic is not offensive to you. No. Okay, got it. Thanks for clarifying. Cool. Uh, again, I can only really speak for myself and other autistics that I've interacted with. Um, obviously, there's going to be people of a community that might feel otherwise. I, I think I saw a comment, it's up to the individual. And I think that's important as well to consider, is that some individuals will prefer to be referred to as individual with autism. Some will be referred to as autistic individual. And I think both should be honored based on the the individual person. Yeah. Cool. Anything else that you want to tell us or, or explain to us about, you know, what's going on in the autistic community or um, anything that you want to raise awareness of? Um, I'm currently doing a charity event for Autistic Self Advocacy Network. Uh, we've raised $16,840 so far this month. This is my third year uh, running Warriors for Autism uh, in World of Warcraft. I eventually would like to start my own charity focusing on helping autistic adults. I want to focus on, um, you know, things like housing and employment and kind of like creating this, this community that is self-sustaining. But in the meantime, one of the most important things is I think self-advocacy, equipping autistics to be able to advocate for ourselves to illustrate what autism is so that the the broader population can understand who we are is incredibly important. And it's one of the reasons why I've been really, really proud to support ASAN for these past three years. Awesome. Can I ask one clarifying question? Sorry about the terminology. Yeah, go ahead. Is the term autist, uh, hopefully that's not a bannable term, but do you know, uh, but is that offensive or is that okay? I'm not a big fan of autist. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know about others. Like I, I can't speak on that one with any authority. Um, but I know that autist has a bit more slang to it in that it has negative connotations kind of similar to, um, Spurg. A lot of people don't know that Spurg comes from Asperger's and that a lot of the characteristics that you absorb or associate to Spurg are the negative characteristics that you associate to autism. Hmm. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, I, I sort of am more familiar with that term in terms of like, I do find it to be a little bit more derogatory and stigma inducing. Um, I basically don't see it used outside of 4chan, which I think by definition makes it a little bit less savory. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so, but thanks for clarifying, Des. I appreciate that. Of course. Um, any, so sometimes I'll teach people how to meditate on stream. Is that interesting to you? I actually used to meditate a lot when I was younger. Um, I got harassed a lot for that. Like one time when I was in a um, after school care thing, I would be meditating and not even joking. Uh, one of the employees there uh, took their drink and threw it in my face. That's crazy, man. Yeah. Um, I, I wish <laughs> I have so many stories like this. Uh, childhood was rough Sounds but like yeah it, right? um so meditating yes i haven't done in many 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 years but um i used to quite regularly um okay so i i can teach you like a relatively introductory technique which we do frequently on stream um maybe we can all do it together but it's a good technique because it actually increases your sympathetic. Uh, let me think about this. So there's one that balances your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And there's another one that, um, are you suppress a yawn? No. Okay. I, I just felt like I got a yawning signal from you, but, <laughs> um, I, I just took a deep breath. It's like, like, like getting prepared to meditate. <laughs> 
Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, he's trying not to yawn to 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 be polite, and he's been programmed. So. <laughs> oh no no! Oh my god! I um, I was taking uh physics, a, a calculus based physics, and it was lit at night, mm-hmm. and I totally forgot where I was, and I just let out this big. Oh, while the teacher was talking. Yeah. Um, I have something to show you real quick. Uh, so I can give you two <laughs> options for a technique. One is one that balances your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And another one actually activates your par- parasympathetic <laughs> nervous system more directly. Uh, this is not what I was looking for, but I think it's interesting. Um, so there's some evidence that people with who are test high on sociopathy don't actually um, uh, people who test high on on the sociopathy scale actually don't uh, um, they don't uh, yawn the same way. So. Like, if a contagious yawning is less common in people who are sociopaths. So if you guys right. are, for those of you on Twitch chat who are yawning with us, you are less likely to be a sociopath. And for those of you who are not yawning, you are more likely to be a sociopath. Um, I, th- this is not the paper I was looking for, but I, I, I grabbed it anyway, just because I think it's interesting because this one talks about autism versus psychopathic traits. I've never seen a paper that compares the two, but I'll have to look at this. I can send this to yeah, you if you want. I, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd actually really like that. Yeah. That was actually one of the hardest things I found about my master's program was reading papers. Oh, God. I, I hate papers so much. I think that's the ADHD part, though. Anna Luddy. I don't know her, but okay. Interesting. Um, so in terms of, uh, meditation, you want, you know, we can do something that is, um, whatchamacall, um, we can do something that's parasympathetic and sympathetic or something that it really recruits the parasympathetic nervous system more directly. Uh, let's try the parasympathetic more directly. Okay. So I'm going to teach you um, a technique called bellows breath. Actually, let me think about it. Let's teach you something new. Um, So I'm going to teach you... Mm, Hold on. Yeah, okay. I'm I'm going to teach you a technique called bellows breath. Or... No, that's not the translation. Um, I'm going to teach you... I forget what the Sanskrit word is, but I'm going to teach you. Yeah, let's just call it Bell's breath. It's technically not correct. But so what I'm going to do is uh, do a series of rapid, forceful exhalations, followed by a passive inhalation. It's kind of hard to describe it. You'll you'll understand, I think, hopefully when I show you. So we're going to breathe very rapidly, focusing on the exhalation. And then what's going to happen is our CO2 level is going to drop really low. And so as our CO2, as we become hypocarbic, our respiratory drive is going to compensate by slowing down our breathing. And so as, as we slow down our breathing, it's going to be like really, really natural. And then we'll sort of be in this like chill state afterward. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'll just demonstrate. So we're going to start with like, I'll do nine breaths. And I'm going to blow out X forcefully through the nose. Nine times. And um, it sounds kind of weird, but I'm not going to focus on inhaling. I'm just going to try to push out air over and over and over again. And then after nine breaths, I'm going to just be silent. Okay, so ready? Hold on, I need Kleenex. (laughs) The snot came out. Okay, here we go. Did you get that? So nine forceful exhalations. 
Okay. Okay. So I'm going to try this. Let's, I'm going to watch you do it. Okay. Okay. So breathe out hard nine times and then just chill after. Okay. Good. So second time around, we're going to do, let's do 15 with our eyes closed. Okay. So take a deep, so close your eyes, take a deep breath in and begin. All right, let's do 20 now. How do you feel after the 15 breaths? Confused, mostly. <laughs> okay, so let's try 20. Am, okay. am I supposed to breathe in directly after the 15, or do I hold my breath there for a bit? Don't hold I'd... your breath. Okay. Just do whatever feels natural. Because so holding chance... my breath is what felt natural, because like I just but... didn't want to breathe. Yep, yep, that's the point. So, but don't okay. try to hold your breath, right? So I, I told you that there's going to be a natural slowing of your respiratory rate because you're hypocarbic. So your, 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 your mind will, st like, you'll feel like not breathing. And then as you don't breathe, it'll actually, like, recruit your vagal systems. Okay. Right? So rapid breathing is associated with this sympathetic nervous system activity, increased respiratory rate. So what we're doing is recruiting naturally our vagal system okay okay so let's do 20 breaths ready take a deep breath in go So we're just going to sit in this space for about 60 seconds. When you're ready, go ahead and come on back. How are you feeling? It feels very similar to like a hot shower or a hot tub or relaxing on the couch with a loved one. Interesting. Relaxing on the couch with a loved one meditation. Well, yeah, like <laughs> like there's these times where like you just find a really good show. It's not like super like exciting, but you just feel so at peace with your your loved one. That you just kind of like melt into the couch. You don't right. really know how to. Yeah. So that's what we call parasympathetic activation. Right. That's a beautiful way to describe it, actually. It's like, you know, you're kind of recruiting your floatiness, your chillingness. And, um, I, you know, I, I'd be a little bit careful, Des. Like I'd experiment a little bit on your own. Um, maybe if you have a clinician involved, uh, you know, just touch base with them. But my hope would be that if you're ramping up towards like an autistic meltdown, you may be able to use this to recruit some of that floaty sensation. You just got to be a little bit careful that that initial hyperventilation phase doesn't actually make things worse. Chances are I use this technique um, for people with, who have panic attacks and if they can do it kind of early enough, they can sort of stave off the panic attack. 
And a lot of times, even in the middle of a panic, panic attack, it can be helpful. And they always tell me when I, when I do it with someone who's acutely in a panic attack, like in the emergency room, they say it doesn't help. But then a week later, they're like, yeah, that actually helped a lot. I just didn't realize it at the time. So I, I didn't use this metaphor earlier, um, but I think it's a good example to describe kind of the, the difference between neurotypical response and autistic response. It's like we have this, this water balloon, right? And so the water balloon can hold so much water. Um, and eventually, if there's too much water gets in it, it bursts, right? I feel like normal individuals have valves towards the bottom of it. So it takes a lot of water and a lot of like mis misfortunate circumstances for it to actually fill enough to burst. Um, so eventually, like as water comes in, water goes out. For those of us with autism, or at least for myself specifically, the way I would describe it is we have a much smaller balloon and the valves are at the very top. Mm. So as it fills with water, um, it takes longer for water to come back out, so it fills up at a much more rapid rate than the, the water like going out. Um, so we're more likely to hit that burst point before we realize that we're full. So it's, mm -hmm. it's really hard and requires a lot of um, cognition of, like, there's water in here. I need yep. to, to start prepping and preparing myself before it even reaches those valves. Well said. Beautiful analogy, Des. So uh, thanks a lot um, for coming on. You know, we really appreciate you coming on, sharing your perspectives about, you know, what it's like to kind of grow up with autism. I think you did a really awesome job of um, showcasing kind of what the experience is on the inside for someone with autism in terms of like, you know, not being able to really understand why things were hard for you, which I think is a really, really good example I hear that the most from people, not with anxiety or depression, but people with autism and ADHD. I don't understand why this is hard for me when it seems so easy for everyone else. Um, it, and, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, go for it. Oh, no, no. I was just going to agree with you. <clears throat> yeah. I, I think it's a beautiful way to describe, you know, because a lot of times people aren't going to know, like, like people who may wonder if they're autistic, I think this is a really key takeaway for them is that if, if things just seem really, really hard for you and like they seem so much easier for other people, there may be something going on like autism or ADHD. Um, exactly. So I think that's actually like a really beautiful way to put it. So thanks very much for coming on. Um, thank you for all the work that you do. I think it's awesome that you're doing it. And um, yeah, man. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This has been really exciting. And this, I was so nervous about today. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I was so nervous, but this was actually really great. I really hope that the, my story and everything's helped connected with others. And I mean, one of my favorite things is people hearing this, the story and realizing like, Hey, maybe I'm autistic. You know, and they, they start looking into it, they start pursuing it, and they might finally have answers to why life's been so hard. And yeah. not only that, but to have that connection and to, to finally feel that sense of belonging. Um, yeah, so thanks a lot, man. I'm struggling to not make, an, a, make a joke about how much of a Chad you are. Like, you guys can find <laughs> Des at twitch.tv slash Des the Autistic Chad. <laughs> uh, but it's Des Mephisto, right? Yes, Des Mephisto. So check out Des on, on Twitch and good luck, man. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Okay, who are we rating, chat?